8, and it's 8 o'clock, and uh, this is the Bob Leonard Show. We'll be with you for about an hour. And we tell you every week that we take the stories you've been reading about in the newspaper and watching on television over the last week, 10 days, and we put our spin on it. We, we try to go behind the 90-second uh, uh, videos you see on television and tell you what's really behind that 90-second story. And then we do that with the newspaper stories. So, uh, you know, like we tell you, it's only our uh, opinion and it's our spin on the story and you can accept or reject it. Uh, but, you know, obviously we're going to have our say, and, and that's why we're here, and that's why probably you're looking in. So, um, we usually rebroadcast this show on Wednesday night from 11 to 12, but last week it didn't get on, and they don't know why here at Comcast, but it should be rebroadcast tomorrow night between 11 and 12. Now... If you miss it Tuesday night and Wednesday night, it's shown continuously on uh, FlintTalk.com. So you just punch that in on your your computer, and it'll come up, and the program is just going on continuously. So either way, now I've been told that it uh, comes in even better on the computer. So uh, if you get a chance to... Uh, Look in on your computer if you miss Tuesday and Wednesday night. Well, we have a, a number of things we want to talk about tonight, uh, but one thing is uh, that we find interesting. We're going to interview uh, Dale Buchanan. Dale is the president of the city council, and he's up for recall election, I think on the 27th of February or thereabouts. And the question, of course, is, what's this all about? Now, you hear all his uh, uh, enemies talking at the city council and making these crazy accusations against him, so we thought we'd give him an opportunity to tell us and tell you what he thinks it's about and what he's accomplished while he's been on the city council. He's been on there a number of years, and uh, he's uh, been elected president by his uh, colleagues twice now. Uh, and um, I, I'm sure you'll be interested in what he has to say. But first, there's a couple of matters we want to talk about before we get to Daryl's interview. Uh, we, want, we want to see if we can put in proper perspective tonight what really happened in the sexual assault case of Julius Anthony. You might recall, he's the fellow that was hired by the Flint School Superintendent Walter Moulton and the Flint Board of Education. Uh, now, Moulton was uh, Anthony's close friend and former business associate. He picked him to be director of curriculum and instructional services here in the Flint school system. And now, after he was hired, almost a year later, it was discovered he had a sexual assault conviction in Atlanta, Georgia, seven years ago, on a three-year-old boy. Now, why it took this long to find that out was because, and I'm very suspicious of this, his friend, uh, the, the superintendent, Melton, uh, did not have his record checked, nor did Anthony. The two of them were the only two in the school district that didn't have it checked, and the administrators at the school district were constantly emailing Milton to have his fingerprints taken so that he, and then Anthony's fingerprints taken, so they could be checked. That is required by state law. And he just ignored it. He just ignored it. Now, <clears throat> as, as soon as it was discovered that, uh, that Anthony didn't register as a sex offender when he came to Michigan about a year and a half ago, this is required by state law. Well, when it was learned that, <laughs> you know, and that's not a failure to do so, it, it's a felony. 
Now, after this <coughs> disclosure, <coughs> excuse me, and Anthony's failure to register, the Genesee County Prosecutor David Late notified Anthony if he registered within 10 days of, the, of his notification to him, he would not prosecute him. Uh, it sounded fair and reasonable, I guess. And then after hearing nothing from Anthony concerning his ultimatum, he, heard, he didn't hear from him for about a month. He went way past the 10 days. Leighton issued a warrant under the Michigan law for failing to register. Now keep in mind, when Anthony was accused and it came out in the news media, uh, you know, he never said, hey, I'm not guilty or I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, I never violated any sexual laws. He never said a thing. He just got out of town. Not a word from him until recently. Now what happened, you know, uh, according to what Anthony says, is that it, his attorney pleaded guilty for him in abstentia, which apparently you can do in Georgia in some of these cases. And Anthony says, in effect, I, you know, I didn't know that. I didn't give him authority to do that. Now, Anthony's present attorney, Georgia attorney, as a result of Anthony's denial, had a court hearing in Georgia where Anthony testified he didn't plead guilty and he did not authorize his attorney to plead guilty for him, as I say, in abstentia. Now, the, you must realize the only other person probably that could refute Anthony's claim the attorney, was the attorney that represented them between 1996 and 2000. He's the one that entered the plea of guilty uh, according to the records. But he refused to testify. As a result, the judge kind of had no other choice. He dismissed the case on the grounds of Anthony's testimony was the only statement under oath that could not be contradicted because the attorney <laughs> refused to testify, the one that would probably know whether or not he had conversations with Anthony about this and had his approval. Now, you know, since these events, there's been, you know, a considerable suspicion and speculation on the part of many people here in this community that Anthony's assertion that he did not plead guilty or give his attorney authorization to plead guilty for him under, judge, under uh, Georgia law in Atlanta seven years ago, a lot of people think it's bogus. And of course, because of the passage of time here, you know, 10 years ago charged, seven years ago pleaded guilty according to the records, in a denial by Anthony that he authorized this attorney to plead guilty for him in absentia could not now be effectively challenged because of the time period and because the attorney refused to testify. Now, this whole thing looks like it might be have been orchestrated to get Anthony off the hook, notwithstanding that he might have been guilty of something so heinous as sexually assaulting a three-year-old child. And as a result, he would have no record and no one would know anything about it. Now, as I say, there's considerable concern that this exercise in legal gymnastic down there in Georgia will have the effect of turning loose a full-blown pedophile on the suspecting public. Now, for a moment, let's look at the circumstances surrounding this case, which clearly justifies the public suspicion 
that this case dismissal on land in the land is a sham. Now here's the theory in this case. Anthony, for the first time now, we hear he claims he didn't know that his attorney pleaded guilty for him, or did he authorize that? So if he didn't know the attorney pleaded guilty for him and didn't authorize that, it kind of vitiates the whole thing. So he claims he had no reason to register because he had many criminal convictions that he knew of. Therefore, he had no intent or no knowledge about that he had a register under the law. I mean, that's his theory. Now, let's look at some of the facts, the sequence of these facts that indicate to me and others he knew what was going on here. Keep in mind, he was originally charged in 1996 with a felony a serious felony of sexual assaulting a youngster. 20-year felony. Now, after being charged, Anthony was given a lie detector test concerning the assault on a three-year-old boy. He failed it miserably. Now, after this, there was some kind of a probation uh, that was entered into after... Uh, this plea of guilty, apparently, by this attorney. And Anthony was required to attend psychological sessions for sexual offenders. At least that was the basis of having to go to these sessions. Now you have to ask yourself, He's making this claim he didn't know that uh, he had been convicted and therefore he didn't have to register. What does he think happened to this case? It, it just evaporated in thin air? This serious case? Why would a man who's claiming he was innocent attend these psychological se uh, sessions for sexual offenders? And like I said, what does he think? The case just disappeared? This was a serious case. So here we sit with this situation. The Front Board of Education and the school administrators don't even check his record as required by Michigan law for nine months. That's a violation of the law by these people. Michigan law requires the records to be checked if you're in the school system. Whether you're a custodian, uh, you're working in the kitchen, you're a teacher, you're an administrator. And they were the only two that hadn't been checked. Was that a coincidence? Because of course if they're checked, Anthony's record pops up. So he's hired, notwithstanding there's no record check. But after a while, the teachers' union, and God bless them, demands to look at the results of his record check, Anthony's record check, and, and Milton's record check. Then they find out there is no record check been made. So then the heat comes down, and Milton agrees to have the records checked, and of course, the three-year-old boy's assault is disclosed. And like I say, he, you know, without any explanation, just resigns and leaves town without a word. Like, I'm not guilty. I never knew my attorney pleaded me guilty. Uh, didn't have to register because I didn't know the attorney pleaded guilty. Uh, you know, and Leighton gave the ultimatum. Register or be charged. Anthony ignores it. Now that was a time clearly where he said, here's the situation. You know, this kind of is a, a, a new defense, kind of an afterthought, in my mind, that shows up after 10 years. I didn't know I had the... Uh, I didn't know I had pleaded guilty to a sex crime. You know, 10 years to charge. 
seven years the, the plea. Yeah, and that's crazy. You know, these facts, in my mind, clearly challenge and dispute Anthony's new denials. Now, here's, here's a, something I want to read from the lie detector test that Anthony took and failed, and I think this is important. It's hard to visualize what we mean by failed. And so I'm going to read you the defining question in my mind on these lie detector tests. Now, it's kind of graphic, so if you don't want kids to look in, you know, send them out of the room or something. But here, here's the question, the defining question that was asked. And they, they mentioned the boy's name. I'm not going to mention it's a three-year-old. And the question is asked by the polygraph operator of Anthony. Did you fondle, it gives the name, of the three-year-old boy's penis? Anthony's answer was no, and the lie detector operator said he was lying. He said he's clearly deceptive with that answer. It was after that that he began the sessions, the psychological ses sessions on his, uh, for criminal sexual assault. Now, <laughs> if, if, does he think that again just evaporated? He voluntarily entered the psychologic, psychological sessions for sex offenders. Does this look like an innocent guy? Now, ultimately, the case was reduced down, and I think that was the, the deal. He takes the sessions, the case would be reduced down. And I think that uh, the attorney probably had authority to do plead guilty in this case from Anthony. Again, the case can't just disappear. You know, Anthony has a history of lying. You remember when he came in here, he, in the application he made out, he said he had a master's degree which was required for this position, and he had so many years of experience as a teacher in the classroom. These turned out to be lies. Now, you have to ask, when you look at the paper about the school board people uh, defending him, is this the kind of guy the school boy should be defending? You know, this turn of events where we're going to end up, in my mind, and I believe this to be true, that this guy has a very serious uh, problem, sexual problem, when it comes to youngster, young kids. Is this the kind of guy you want to turn loose on society? on a mere technicality. You know, this reminds me of the George Crew case. You remember that was the case where the teacher at uh, uh, Whittier School had been sexually assaulting uh, 11, 12, 13 year old girls for a number of years while he was in the music department over there. And then when the front school system found out about it, rather than uh, disclose it because it might make them look bad, they hid it. And they made an agreement with, uh, with Creel that if uh, no one asked specifically about these uh, uh, allegations against them for sexually assaulting numerous young girls, uh, they wouldn't bring it up and uh, that if he would resign. So he resigned, went to Florida, did the same thing in Florida, in Cle and what happened there was a young girl that was uh, included in this group that committed suicide over it, according to the records and the, and the doctors down in Florida. Are we going to allow this to happen again? Here we, there we had a school system, an institution of our government, that covered it up. And here we have a court system now, a legal system 
that appears to be doing the same thing. You know, this guy's business is dealing with kids. He, he was arrested on this three-year-old in the child care center where he was working. He's, he's a school teacher. He'll be in more school because there'll be no record of this information. I think that Wrighton could have charged this guy because when he came to Michigan, he did have a record and he should have registered. Now you have to ask, if you were a parent or a grandparent with a child or a grandchild in the Finn school system, would you want Anthony dealing with your kids or any kids anywhere? If it's only available because he got out of the sexual assault case on a three-year-old child on a technicality. The bottom line is I see it. I believe Anthony knew of his conviction. Even if his lawyer did uh, pleaded guilty in absentia on his behalf. But whatever the case is, this guy is a dangerous guy. He's dangerous to children. He's dangerous to the community. So, anyway, all of these facts would indicate to me that there's more to this case than this technical dismissal down in Georgia. We'll keep watching it. And hopefully uh, it won't backfire on the legal system and everybody that's trying to make a hero out of this guy. Keep in mind, David Layton should be commended for his efforts to, the, to do this, that is, get him branded as a, as a sex offender, making him register, rather than people calling a racist by rabble-rousers who are just trying to promote their own self-interest. We'll see what happens here now. Now there's a, uh, you know, a terrible tragedy that happened here the last week or so. Uh, you've probably heard about it. Uh, the sheriff, uh, the officer cover-up where uh, a Marine just back from active duty in, in uh, Iraq was run over and killed by a hit-and-run driver uh, and, uh, who uh, left the scene and left a Marine to die on the side of the road. You know, this case started out as kind of a routine, but tragic hit-and-run death case. By routine, I mean, you, you had to try to find the person who was driving the car. It was unknown. It was believed at that time it was unknown. But you, when you look at the journal story, you realize there's something more to it. It says, officer cover up, question mark. What does that mean? Well, we know what it means. Here's what happened. The original call came into the uh, 911 center around 3.30 in the morning. The caller claimed we a, uh, a Flint cop just off duty and alone. Now that's important. 911 calls back to the, uh, the number uh, on the caller's ID to tell the call the ambulance was on the way. On the way, the, uh, the 911 operator hears a second voice person's voice in the background after the guy said he was all alone. He, the cop, when he says he's the only one there, when in fact he's there with the driver of the car that killed the Marine, and the cop, I, you know, strangely ironic, the cop is using the driver's cell phone to call 911. As it turned out, the driver and the cop are good friends who had been drinking together earlier that evening in the bar. There's no evidence that either one of them were drunk because we don't know because the guy ran off. When the sheriff uh, uh, deputy, uh, a fellow by the name of Tom Palis, 
began his investigation later that morning, the case appeared to be a kind of a routine hit and run which tragically caused the death of this young Marine. Well, the deputy went to the 911 uh, uh, agency and picked up the 911 tapes uh, where the cop was calling about the accident. A routine procedure on his part. But he listened to both tapes and found inconsistency. The first tape, the cop says, I'm alone. The second tape, here's the second person in the background say this. Here's what he said. He hears it on tape. I'm out of here. Good luck. It turned out to be the driver of the car that killed the Marine saying that to his friend, the cop. Now, the, the deputy, uh, Paris, uh, uh, is suspicious and, con suspicious and contacts the cop. The cop admits the cover-up. He even admits he saw the accident happening. The car stopped. The cop, uh, the cop recognizes his friend from the bar as the guy that was driving the car. He doesn't call 911 right away until he returns from hiding his friend's car in his garage about a half a mile away. The cop says he tried to help the Marine, but he determined that he had expired. You know, the irony is, I'd say the cop called from, from the uh, friend's 911 phone. And he admits that the person the deputy heard on the second tape was his friend saying, he's out of here. The guy left and ran through some cornfield out there in the, on somebody's farm and disappeared. You know, there's an old saying, I'm sure you've heard it, that a cover-up of a crime invariably becomes, becomes more severe than the crime itself. Here we have this, this conspiracy between these two people to cover up this crime. What did they do? They conspired to obst obstruct justice, which means letting this case go forward in the court system, if that's what it would take, and conspiracy to cover up the person leaving the scene of a, a personal uh, uh, injury accident causing death. That's what he did. And so they're both involved, so it's a, a conspiracy. These are serious felony crimes. And the great tragedy here is, besides this Marine who uh, had just come from a reception where he sang a song and songs there, was in his Marine dress outfit because he couldn't afford it, apparently a, a, a suit to go to this thing. And he was walking up the middle of the road when he was hit. Now the 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 other tragedy is these, if the 911 was called immediately and told about the accident and the driver stayed there and the cops stayed there, there's a likelihood there was no crime. Here's a, here's a young man walking down the middle of the road in the middle of the night, it's dark, visibility bad, and he's hit by someone driving a car along the road coming over a hill and probably didn't see him until the last moment. Couldn't avoid him. No, nothing illegal, nothing wrong. If they did the right thing, everything might have been all right. They didn't do the right thing. And that's where they might end up being charged with a crime. It's a great tragedy, losing the young man causing his death, but also another tragedy where these two people, if they just left things alone, neither one of them would be, probably be in trouble today. Let's go to the interview with the president of city council, Darrell Buchanan, and uh, hear what he has to say. Can you play that, please? 
today with Daryl Buchanan, the City city of Flint Council President. Good morning, Daryl. Good morning. How you doing? As President of Flint City Council, what is your role? Sometimes, Sally, uh, I juggle so many things. You don't know from day to day, but generally uh, it's to uh, facilitate the uh, council meetings, to help council members become acclimated with any policy issues that pose them a specific problem to uh, facilitate discussions with the administration if there is a problem to uh, initiate discussions amongst council members uh, about the budget uh, just in general just be a conduit of information and it's sort of a uh, a rock in troubled times <laughs> how did you get into politics and what is your background <laughs> uh, i started in politics in 1972 when they changed the voting requirement uh, to 18 years old. Uh, I've been involved in uh, Senate campaigns, presidential campaigns. I interned in the office of Senator Regal, uh, studied political science at Covington College of Liberia, West Africa. I'm a product of the Flint public school system. I, I graduated and I attended Kalamazoo College and got a BA in political science. I was a Thurgood Marshall graduate fellow at Western Michigan. Um, and now I'm back in Flint. I teach political science at Baker College. And I've taught at numerous schools uh, in the city of Flint. I've always uh, loved to be involved in politics and just helping people. You work diligently to improve the neighborhoods in the first ward. You're definitely a hands-on council person, and you get out and lead in the cleanups in your ward. Also, you fought diligently to get Ashbury Heights torn down in a new housing complex built in its place. Why don't you tell us about some of your efforts in your ward? A lot of the things we do, uh, we ride in the back of garbage trucks and we, uh, we go and clean up neighborhoods to try to improve the quality of life for first world residents. Uh, I'm glad you brought up Ashbury Heights. Uh, it was located on the corner of uh, West Bridge Line and ML King. It was one of the most blighted areas uh, in the county and no one could get it torn down but through discussions with the uh, uh, financial manager, Mr. Kurtz, and others, um, the property was demolished and on it now sits a beautiful uh, townhouse development called Rosewood Townhouses. Uh, we're demolishing houses, we're paving streets, uh, we put 80, uh, 60 yard, well, 60, 80 yard dumpsters up to the Hasselbrain Center where uh, people could dump for free instead of dumping on private property. Uh, we've helped the residents of Slidell Manor uh, get furniture uh, for the housing complex when the furniture was, uh, was taken out. We give Christmas dinners, we help people with water billings. Uh, there's just a myriad of issues uh, that we help. Uh, street paving, it's, it's just people always complain about the streets. We've, we've done uh, excellent work with the streets. Uh, we help people resolve water billing problems, uh, uh, drug issues. Uh, there are just a lot of things uh, that we do. And if people look around the first world, they, they can see the uh, quality of life progressively beginning to improve in a direction uh, that we're all comfortable with. We have a long way to go, uh, well, but we're not where we were when I was elected in uh, 2000. We were $40 million in debt. We didn't have the money to do uh, complete the construction of Pearson Road. Our bond rating was horrendous, uh, but now we are moving towards an $8.9 million surplus. Uh, we're building bridges. We have the uh, uh, money to uh, put up our fair share if we're getting state and federal uh, matching foreign projects. We have it now, but before uh, we didn't. Uh, and that's positive. And it has to make people, uh, I know it makes me feel better, I know it makes my colleagues feel a lot better, that we're moving to the uh, positive side of the ledger and the long and the red. Uh, the state has given our, fi our finance department several awards and, and the feds regarding uh, their financial. Uh, uh, documents uh, that they submit uh, that show uh, uh, the spending patterns uh, of the city of Flint. And that, that makes me proud. You were instrumental in getting the Hasselbrin Center reopened, weren't you? We fought hard to keep Hasselbrin open because uh, I am committed to seniors and seniors need a quality and a safe uh, place to fellowship and talk to one another. That's healthy. They need that type of uh, cognitive interaction uh, with their peers. We can sit and talk with them all day, but they're more comfortable with people of their own age. You uh, were behind bringing the NAACP conference to Flint? We, we, we talked and um, I gave my input on that uh, issue, but more importantly, uh, the, the NAACP and I were active in bringing the Justice Department here to help resolve some outstanding issues with the uh, 
from the police department. Uh, I've given my input on the police contracts and other contracts. Uh, I, I don't do the negotiating, but I, I do offer my opinion if I think something needs to be moved forward. Uh, and the administration has uh, and does listen. You have to communicate in a very positive manner. No one will solicit your input if you holler, if you rant and rave, and if you accuse without any uh, information to substantiate what you're accusing individuals of. It's about working together for the improvement of the city of Flint, not for our own personal egos at council meetings. Now, the uh, Flint Police Department has worked with the um, North Central Weed and Seed up in that Saginaw Street area and in towards your road yes. is reducing crime. How effective has that policy been? They're, they're working very well. A primary example, at the corner of North Saginaw and Pearson, uh, there were shootings, there was gang activity, but the uh, uh, interaction of the Flint Police Department with the Weed and Seed reduced that at that uh, area almost to zero. Uh, the Weed and Seed, they're doing a very uh, a good job. They pay for overtime with monies that the city uh, doesn't have to put officers or programs in place uh, that, that positive, uh, have a positive impact in this community. They do a great job. Now, Bill, I know that you have brought up in council at least two apartment complexes in your world that are experiencing blight. Yes. How is your effort to resolve that issue coming? It, it, it's coming. The last is the, the old Deerbrook uh, estates across from Flint Northwestern. Uh, a person has purchased it, they're rehabbing, and they're making the needed improvements to keep the housing values up in that area. They're doing a great job. The second one they always pushed was uh, Asbury Heights. They're moving in the right direction. Slidell Manor is making improvements. They're moving in the right direction. Uh, that's because we all work together and we interact. When I say we, I'm talking about the city, uh, the state, uh, and the feds to improve the quality of life for seniors and the poor in the city of Flint and Genesee County. Okay, as a leader in the Flint City Council, you've addressed several issues that you perceive to be ethical dilemmas regarding the rules of the City Council. Now, one of, these, one of those dilemmas concerns the giving of extra speaking time to selected individuals. I have watched you try to stop that. Um, unfortunately, the rest of the council has been lax in working with you to eliminate this practice. Not, not, stop. not, not really lax. They're, they're, they're trying to uh, uh, help and facilitate that process as, as much as uh, they can. Uh, some council members, I knew at least six, uh, they're new to the council, and they're working at the uh, resolution of, of these issues. Uh, they give us positive input, and, and they have in their possession, all council, uh, draft proposed rule changes. See, a lot, these rules have been in effect since 1975, and some people want us to change them overnight. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, it, it takes time, it, 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 takes, uh, it has to go through trial and error, and specific uh, individuals have to become tired of, of certain rules that inhibit the flow of council meetings, and, and they're at that point. Uh, my colleagues, they're very supportive. The information is just new. Well, two meetings ago, a citizen expressed the view uh, that this policy of, uh, violated the First Amendment. So are you going to bring this up to your fellow council members, and where do you go from here? I've I, I discussed it with my colleagues. I believe in First Amendment rights. I believe in freedom of speech. Uh, but freedom of speech doesn't include the heckler's veto. It doesn't include uh, personal attacks on individuals, which are in our council rules. It, 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 it doesn't include you just hollering out into the audience and not addressing, addressing council uh, with your uh, uh, specific issues. Council meetings should be civil and professional uh, uh, in their orientation, not a place where people come with uh, verbally combative agendas to personally attack council members uh, who offer input that have nothing to do with the constructive revitalization of this community. You can talk about me all you want. Just be civil about it. Severity has been one issue that you've brought up many times. Uh, it appears that you seem to be making some progress in this area. Do you believe that? We're, we're, we're making progress. And, and, and to let you uh, uh, know that, uh, in other municipalities, people have been tasered at council meetings. We don't go through that. We just ask you to please sit down. Uh, we refrain from disrupting the meetings. 
because no one disrupted you. And I believe that 98% of the people that come to council meetings do have constructive input. There are some individuals that this is their, they have two times a month, two times a month where they can come and try out for a play. And this is where, and they come to council meetings just trying to show off, just say whatever they can, but we listen, that's their right. Now, as I talk to people in the community, and even the Flint Journal has expressed this, there's a strong opinion that sometimes the council is like a circus. But sometimes when people come and they exhibit this disruptive behavior, I can see where people would get that opinion. But all council members, all nine of us, want the environment to be a professional one, not a circus environment. That's why we try to implement the rules, try to have people talk to council in a civil and professional manner, and refrain from the personal attacks, refrain from all the antics. Just be professional in your deployment and your delivery of your presentation. That's all we ask. Ninety-eight percent of the people that come to council meetings, they do that. It's the other two percent we're trying to work on. And if we can get them in line with following the rules, not doing anything to inhibit their First Amendment rights, we'll be moving in that direction. We have a great community, and ninety-eight percent of the people that come to council meetings, they show us that. One of the things I'd like to address, people go around talking about Daryl Buchanan's in the mayor's pocket. The only pocket I'm in are the constituents in the first ward. They say Daryl Buchanan shouldn't talk to the mayor. That is nonsense. I try to exhibit the same behavior as Congressman Kildee, Senator Levin, and Senator Stabenow exhibit when they work with Bush to bring programs and dollars into this community. Just think if our congressmen and our senators could not talk to the president of people accessible to the president to get things done. Another example of this great behavior that other municipalities reward. Bob Emerson, the budget director. Governor Granholm said the primary reason, there were other reasons, but the primary reason that she picked Mr. Emerson, he can work both sides of the aisle. For those who don't know what that means, he can talk to Democrats and Republicans to get things done. They don't say that these folk are in people's pockets. They reward them for that type of uh, malleability in their delivery and their relationships with people. They don't say they're in people's pockets. You're supposed to be at the table to work to get things done in a city, in a state, or on the federal level. That doesn't mean in anyone's pocket. It just means that the people in the first ward have someone at the table who is doing, uh, engaging in constructive dialogue to improve the quality of life in the first ward. And that's why we were elected. I represent over 11,000 people, not Daryl Buchanan's ego. So I must put my ego on the back burner and work for the citizens of the first ward. I'm council president, but my primary concern is with my ward. I do everything I can to do that. That's why I ride on the back of garbage trucks. Uh, that's why we pick up paper in the middle of the streets when we see it, put garbage cans back on, on the grass, and that's why we stop and we, and we talk to different people. That's my job. My job is to be at the table and to talk with the individuals who can improve the first ward, and that is what uh, I try to do. It would be insane for me to get in a verbal exchange with uh, the chief elected official in this city where I would build up a wall where I could not call him on the phone to get streets plowed, garbage picked up, or some assistance with an outstanding water bill uh, for a senior citizen, or get some garbage picked up, or get these demolished uh, abandoned homes away uh, out of the way of the children that have to walk to school by them so some young lady or some young boy isn't pulled inside and hurt. I work very hard to try to improve uh, the quality of policing services in this city. This city, we do need a permanent police chief. I will never get away from that. We need one. But you need constructive dialogue to get one. Hollering and ranting, raving will not change uh, an individual's uh, uh, opinion about how to uh, improve police services um, uh, in the city of Flint. The politicians the elected officials that I've lived uh, uh, to see bring about a positive change in city, state, and federal politics, talking in a professional manner to the chief executive. They're at the table working, not for their own private interests, but for the interests of, of the citizens uh, that they represent. 
They don't holler. They don't rant and rave. They do things that are constructive, uh, Ms. Haywood, uh, not destructive. They, they work by uh, political cooperation and not by political terrorism. When you come to a council meeting and threaten an elected official that if you do not do what I say, I'm going to recall you, that's political terrorism. And, and we in America, uh, we don't negotiate with terrorists. We don't do it on the municipal level, we don't do it on the state level, we do, don't do it on the federal level. My political socialization, when it comes to terrorists, is based on what the federal government does. We do not negotiate. If you want to talk to me, don't come howling at me. Pull me aside and talk to me in a manner that's socially acceptable. Anything that's not socially acceptable is not constructive to us having a positive dialogue. Because I will not stand there and talk to people who are just hollering and ranting and raving. The citizens of this community who have their children watching Channel 17, they want to see elected officials in the public acting in a manner that's constructive to the development of their children, not destructive. We always wonder why certain kids behave the way they do. You turn on 17 and the people are ranting and waving are the activists in this area and the activists in that area, but their deportment is not that of someone who I would want my daughter or my grandchildren to emulate their behavior. I want my children to emulate behavior that's constructive to their environment. That doesn't mean we don't disagree on issues, but we don't call one another names. We don't throw things at one another. Because you must remember this, when you criticize someone, you must hope that your words are sweet because one day you may have to eat them, Sally. So it must be constructive, not destructive. And that doesn't mean when we're behind closed doors, we don't argue. But you don't take those arguments out into the public sector where the people you want to respect, you can observe it. But when, they, when you do that, that's when a circus is seen on Channel 17 and not a professional legislative body meeting with the public watching. That's where the circus mentality or circus, the adjective comes in when the discussion becomes more destructive than constructive. I'm not saying we should always agree, uh, but when we disagree, let's do it in a manner that doesn't uh, uh, influence our children. But if I rant and rave, I'll get my way. What we want to do is teach our children that they should communicate in a manner that's socially acceptable, even if I don't win. I got my point across in a professional manner, so if we disagree again, at least I have a chance. That's the, and that's the way we want uh, people to observe us. I want my world to be proud of me, not ashamed. We call elections. If I rob a bank, Sally, steal a car, and I'm an elected official, <laughs> you should come and get me. I don't think that, and that we call is part of our, our, our constitution. And, and, an electoral process. But you recall someone if they've done something wrong, not because you disagree or they don't do what you say when you holler at them. <laughs> Commitment crime, felonies, or other issues, Sally, that's the intent. That was the intent. Not just because you disagree with an individual, but that's an individual's right. And I believe the citizens of the First War are astute enough, uh, Ms. Haywood, to, to, to see uh, when people are deceiving them. Because I like for them to know the devil's busy and we're in the first world, we don't hear his message. <laughs> so Darrell, what issues are you looking forward to bringing up in the next year um, toward, toward your constituents' needs? Um, reducing the uh, crime in the city of Flint, uh, looking for a permanent, uh, facilitating and, and interacting with discussions to get a permanent police chief. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, some truancy issues with the students, uh, more um, um, abandoned houses being demolished, so you're going to wake up at night and see candles burning, uh, um, more uh, uh, improvement on the budget side and save more money with our input and, and, and our votes, uh, adopting new council rules, first time since uh, 1975. Just working to basically improve the quality of life of the citizens uh, in the city of Flint. Um, keeping the police recruits positive uh, so they represent uh, um, the Flint population. Um, and it can be, if, uh, I didn't say color, just represent the Flint population. Let's get, a lot of, let's get people from Flint. So I believe uh, regardless of, of, of color, uh, elected uh, people who work on the police department, where are you from? We interact, we know one another, we can work together and get things done. 
um, bringing more programs at the Hassel Green Senior Center, um, um, working with the individuals at Rosewood, uh, housing development to make sure that property doesn't go into decline, um, continue working uh, with the NAACP and the Justice Department on a wide range of issues. Um, hopefully we can uh, uh, work with the administration to sort of monitor the discussions with the city of Detroit about our water bills. I mean, uh, when I say bills, uh, what we pay for water that we, uh, we, get, we get from Detroit, uh, monitoring and, and trying to make sure that the lawsuits between the council and the administration continue to decline because people are tired of, uh, of having um, um, extensive lawsuits, continue paying the streets and demolishing homes monitoring the rehab of homes on East Ridgeway in Linden by Bryant School as a pilot program, ensuring that Deerbrook Apartments, even though it's private, uh, keeps improving. Those are the types of things that, I, that I'm trying to, to work on. Make people proud of Flint again. So when, when people say Flint, they don't say it like, oh, I hope we're not like Flint. We want to say, we want to be just like Flint, but Flint is also the comeback city of America, just like a lot of other cities. I want Flint to move in that direction. I want to be around and do something with Genesee Towers. <laughs> I, would, I would love to see something happen with that. Um, now, the county passed the senior millage. Yes. Are you going to work with your constituents to come up with a proposal to go to the county to make sure that your seniors uh, get the programs that they want and need? with the county millage money? Yeah, that's a given. Knowing that uh, they have to include House of Green, they know they're coming. I have people like uh, that are working up the House of Green. They're, they're putting ideas together on what we can do. Uh, House of Green is, is, is the standard, I believe, in the county for uh, uh, senior uh, programs and senior facilities. This is the place. The place is in excellent condition. That's the thing we want to do in conjunction with BAAA and, and their professionals. Uh, that can sort of uh, propel us into the forefront again. These are the types of things that, that we can do. Uh, I, I, I want to see uh, uh, the forefront get a uh, uh, housing development. Uh, I, I want to see every world prosper. That's one of the things that's been constant. I'm a cheerleader for every world, but I'm in the trenches in mine. But if I'm called upon, I'll get in the trench in, in any world to help any council person uh, um, that's elected. I want to do more with block clubs. I want block clubs to be more eyes and ears. I want to change the attitude of residents from snitching to be a bad thing to saving someone's life by telling someone in authority to be a good thing. Um, I want to clean up around um, um, some of the convenience stores in the neighborhood. A lot of them are doing very good. Let's tighten up a few loose ends with them and you do it through positive discussion. Because a lot of uh, uh, convenience store owners do great things in our neighborhood. We don't want to lump everyone in the same, uh, uh, put them in the same boat doing great things and help out, and we're going to do it. I'd like to see one day have a, a, um, a party store. I mean, not a party store, but a, a large grocery store in the north end of Flint, somewhere that we all can share from every ward. Uh, those are the types of things that, uh, uh, that I'm looking for. Uh, um, and, and that's about it, just improving the quality of life. But there's just so much we, we really can't really uh, uh, cram it into uh, uh, an hour. Uh, one, of the, one of the proudest things I've ever done on council was introduce fiscal stabilization bonding, which we use to help finance the last eight to nine million dollars of the uh, deficit that we're in. That was one of my proudest moments. <laughs> but uh, that was from discussions with uh, other uh, individuals uh, that work from city government. We give Christmas parties, we give away Thanksgiving turkeys. There's just, there's just so many different things that, that we as council do that, that, that go unnoticed. And we do this thing. We do these things because I'm not in anyone's pocket but the first world pocket. That's the only thing that will get me on the back of a garbage truck is being in the pocket of the residents of the first world. Because that work is hard, it's dirty, but, but it's a job, and, and we work for free. And it's not something we do at election time. It's something we do all the time. We organize numerous neighborhood cleanups. The work we do in the world is, is, is just so extensive um, that, that it's hard to uh, talk about um, in an hour. Uh, as council president, uh, this is my second uh, term, uh, the, the, the budget surplus has just gone up. The information we get from the administration is accurate to the point, and that's because we can sit at the table and get the information uh, that we need. 
if there's a glitch, we'll be getting to form different committees to help resolve these issues. I can't do it alone. Uh, you need help, and the only way new council people can build relationships with the administration is to serve on these commit committees and meet eye to eye to discuss uh, uh, different issues. Sally, am I satisfied? No. But I'm ha am I happy that we're moving forward? Yes, I am. Because um, five years ago, we were $40 million in debt. The state had taken over the administration uh, at City Hall. Uh, people in the neighborhoods had their heads down. Ashbury Heights was an albatross on all of our necks. Uh, Slidell Manor um, was trying to progress, but they were in trouble. House of Rain was about to close. We could pay no streets, and demolition was a myth. But if you look around your neighborhoods, and you be open-minded, you have to say this, that Flint is moving forward. Uh, Darrell Buchanan has done his job. Darrell Buchanan is accessible. And Darrell Buchanan works for the residents of the city of Flint. And that was my, uh, uh, that's what I did when I was ombudsman, and that's what I do now. Some people don't like it. Some people don't like it. But I think a majority of the people do. Uh, because I think a majority of the people in the first world want an elected official that gets uh, the job done for them in a way that makes them proud and it doesn't make them cry. Because a lot of times we let people and they become political terrorists, uh, they become self-centered, and egos are totally out of control, but not in this case. Uh, I've had good mentors and, and we're trying to move the uh, first world forward uh, and we're doing that. Um, we have a long way to go but we're not where we were uh, five years ago. And with the momentum that we have built together, uh, we can get this job done, and we can make the first world the best world uh, in the city of Flint. I'm biased when it comes to my world. I represent, as president, I like every world to do good, but I always prepare a mind to the forefront. And the residents of the first world, they know that. Uh, I can't please everyone. If someone has uh, is dissatisfied with anything I do, I would prefer that they just call me and we talk about it. Don't be deceived by inf people that bring information to you and the information is totally wrong, it's totally inaccurate, uh, and they have self-seeking motive behind that information. If something's wrong, just ask me. Because a lot of people carry uh, a verbal disease and not verbal health. Uh, and they, they carry a political message that's tenured uh, and it's diseased uh, and it's not for the best interest of the people of, of this community. And I didn't call any names. And I haven't... Uh, um, uh, personally attack any individual. The citizens of this community know who carry uh, that negative message. If you put their record against mine in the first world or in the city of Flint, you can see that we've done far more. And that's not bragging, that's just fact. And that's just what we do. I work for people to get things done, not run my mouth. Well, thank you, Darren. This has been very informative. How can someone reach you? You can reach me at 766-7418. Five seven seven zero four five five, or call me at home. Uh, they call me at home from everywhere in the city, <laughs> but I'm but I'm there just to help, uh, and, I, and I appreciate uh, an opportunity to sit down and talk with you. I appreciate talking to uh, uh, an interviewer who allowed me to speak my mind without being attacked, um, and I really appreciate it.